Good evening, and welcome to the fifth night of Navratri, dedicated to Ma as Skandamata, the mother of Skanda, also known as Kartikeya, one of the foremost of our war gods. He takes after his mother in that regard. Of course, before situating Skandamata within the overarching context of the Navratri cycle, it is necessary to briefly introduce Lord Skanda, also known as Kartikeya. Now, it is often held that both of these theonyms refer to the unique circumstances of his rather remarkable conception and birth, and certainly, as applies Kartikeya, of the Kritikas, six of the Pleiades star cluster who gave birth to him. And this is indeed the case. Yet Skanda, which connotes charging, attacking, and leaping or springing forth, well, I can see how this fits into the above rubric, due to the mechanism via which Lord Agni wound up uh, involved, you might say, in the process. To me, it appears far more logical to connect Lord Skanda's role and function as the Great Warrior. Further, the likely Proto-Indo-European roots of the name, often proposed as Skend, to mean jump, but which I would also speculate may include skewed, to shoot or to throw, and is the same root as it happens as skewer in modern English. This is a rather important thing for a soldier equipped with a spear, or as with many depictions of Skanda, seated upon the lap of Skandamata, a bow and arrow. Both of these, the uh, skend that is jump and the skewed that is shoot or throw, seem far more closely connected with the nature of the deity rather than being simply circumstances of conception. For a more in-depth and interconnected examination of the Indo-European mythic saliency of Lord Skanda, especially in relation to an array of related figures, including his mighty father, please consult the Ghost Division article and excerpt series that we put out in belated honour of Mahashivratri last year. In any case, Lord Skanda comes into existence in order to defeat the powerful demon Taraka, who had been granted a boon of conditional immortality by Lord Brahma. Uh, full immortality is not saying which Brahma has the power to give. There is always something which must be capable of killing one, and is frequently by his choice, thus leading to some demons choosing things like no man or um, only a woman can kill me, because they do not think a woman can possibly be a martial threat, or in this case, uh, as with Taraka, only a son of Lord Shiva shall be able to kill me. On grounds that at the time Tarakasura sought immortality, Lord Shiva was very much in mourning as a result of the death of Lady Sati, and having burned karma to ashes, that is to say love, did not appear to be likely to be getting over her any time soon in order to remarry and have a son. As we have seen through the previous phases of the Navadurga mythic cycle, by this point in the story, that is to say, um, when Skandamata uh, has arrived, Parvati and Shiva have once again found each other and have successfully remarried, thus allowing for the potential conception of a child and throwing quite the spanner in the works for Tarakasura's plans of universal domination, if this should eventuate. I won't get into the precise ins and outs of Lord Skanda's backstory, but suffice to say Lord Agni intervenes with the stated reasoning of endeavouring being to keep him safe, even prenatally, from the mighty Tarakthur and his associates. Uh, this leads to a very angry Lady Parvati, cursing Agni with the negative attributes of flame, namely to always be surrounded with the blackened haze of smoke, to be indiscriminate in what he devours, and for his food to always be riven with impurities, amongst others. She does this as he has dared to steal her would-be child who eventually winds up being gestated and birthed by the aforementioned Pleiades. Hence, part of the reason Lord Skanda is often depicted with six heads, one for each mother, uh, in safety elsewhere. Whereupon, Lord Agni returns, apologizes, and explains the reasoning for what he has done, and Lady Parvati accepts Skanda as her son, even though born to different mothers, and begins to impart such martial wisdom and counsel him with the abilities with which she possesses in such grand abundance. And the slaying of the demon ensues, a common myth theme with Durga, as you may perhaps have noticed. 
Now, to bring it back to Skandamata, what we therefore see here is the logical continuation from Ma as Kushmanda. Namely, as Chandraganta to Kushmanda was the fulfillment and elevation of the princess of the moon into the queen of the sun. Skandamata from Kushmanda therefore represents the queen with a sun, and also continues the solar aspect Mithim with additional co connection to fire and its piety. The Hiranyagarbha, the golden cosmic womb, has produced Ishu, a prince, and it is an interesting point of commentary that the force with Hash created and imbued the universe has also produced, as well as is a personification, of war. Perhaps one might speculate, therefore, that war, warfare, is very much fundamental and intrinsic to existence. And indeed, there are an array of other Hindu and other Indo-European, more broadly, myths which further support this contention. For greater detail upon myth, please consult the first section of the Mytholinguistics of War series, which we ran earlier this year. In terms of some of the specific examples, uh, two of the more immediate ones which spring immediately to mind are the subsequent derivation of Orolog in many Nordic and Germanic languages, wherein it goes from meaning supernal law, uh, or meaning uh, outside or above, log of course, uh, law, to destiny or fate, and thence in more modern languages to warfare, a situation which may, to be sure, also have contributed to by the Lager particle of Proto-Germanic, which roughly translates as how the situation lies, hence its interpretation as precedency, regulation, and law, how things are to be done. And secondly, and rather more interestingly for our immediate purposes, the interpretation of Sanskrit Bhutatman to mean war, given that it would more directly mean the soul or essence of uh, being or all being, and can also mean Shiva quite specifically. Appropriate for Odin, wouldn't you say? The aforementioned Sanskrit linguistic elements has been of heightened relevancy when we consider Skandamata immediately following Kushmanda, and both in the context of the mother of the world and the universe entire. Indeed, in certain scriptural readings, who is the universe entire? As the notion of a mother bringing forth her essence is, not least in terms of heredity, what childbirth effectively is. One could also read the sixth line of the famed Devi Sukta of the tenth mandala of the Rigveda, that's uh, hymnal 125, as further supporting this, as it sings of Devi projecting war out into the cosmos, in defense of the holy. The persona of Skandamata does not simply represent the role of a queen in producing an heir, however, as her most magnanimous adoption of Skanda, even though he was born to other women, also represents the practice of adopting into the direct imperial household men who may have other births, yet whose essence speaks true to their lineage, so to speak, as Julius Caesar did for Augustus, as one uh, rather prominent historical example. Meanwhile, the figure of Skanda also represents another weapon, and a most potent one indeed in Devi's arsenal, that of the ability of one's line to continue, of one's work not to end with one, but to be picked up and carried on by one's children, and goals which one would not perhaps be able to accomplish by oneself, being attainable through the effort augmented through kin and progeny. It's just that work and goals in question are warfare and demon slaying in this particular regard. This therefore means that even though Devi Askandamata might seem very different iconographically to the preceding warrior and regal aspects of Mataji, insofar as she does not obviously appear to be armed or equipped with the uh, other accoutrements of rulership, seated there in her lap and steadied by her hand is a very powerful weapon indeed, the infant Lord Skanda. And as is in any case accompanied as ever by Dawan, her mount, after all, Bravery, for such his name means, is a most necessary and powerful weapon indeed. The point around Lord Skanda as himself a weapon has intriguing resonances, a detailed in some greater depth in the Ghost Division article, yet particularly including the figure of Vali from Nordic mythology, whom we might viably identify as the Avenging Son, and whose existence is mandated in prophecy as being necessary for the purposes of punishing those responsible for the death of Baldur, 
as well as surviving Ragnarok and continuing on the Divine Kingdom in the next cycle of creation. While it is important to note that a direct co-identification is uh, problematic due to the nature and quite emphatically due to the circumstances of Vali's maternal parentage, the overarching Mathema Vali, as the son of Urn, who is both warlike, uh, one etymology for his name being Waihalar, the warlike one, the one who confronts, and a living weapon who carries on the divine work of the family and protects ultimately the realm of the gods as a result. Well, it's not hard to see how this resonates rather significantly with Lord Skanda. And who knows, perhaps there is something more than a simple coincidence to the fact that both Skanda and Vali are born to different mothers than Odin Shiva Rudra's wife. But that is purely speculative upon my part, and I have not looked into this particular point in any serious depth, nor am I stating there is necessarily anything to it. Another potential resonance would be with, interestingly enough, Lord Indra, a son of Dyeos Pitar, the Sky Father, potentially the result of a rather unusual pregnancy and birth, as attested in uh, Rigvera Mandala 4, hymn 18, line 5, dependent upon the interpretation, and who in a manner directly comparable to Vali, and likely also to Skanda, almost immediately upon being born, takes up armament to slay the relevant demonic adversary. This is uh, from Rigvera Mandala 8, hymn 45, line 4, but more upon that some other time. The point is, the notion of progeny as prodigious combatants, warriors, weapons with purpose, is evidently a recurrent and endlessly resonant Indo-European theme. And there are doubtless other examples we could consider from both within the Hindu corpus and beyond. To move back to the iconography, her other hands, of which there are usually three, customarily bear lotus flowers and the mudra of Abhaya, although some other depictions have other elements in the mix, such as the instruments of piety we have previously seen, for example a bell, a liquid-bearing vessel, etc. We pray to Ma Eskandamata both to honour her as a mother, especially and obviously as Lord Skanda's mother. Additionally, as this is also her once again, looking after all of us via a creative approach to the slaying of the demonic, and to honour the role and responsibility of motherhood more generally. And, it does bear noting, to worship Lord Skanda as well, not just because there he is seated in her lap, but because it is surely a high form of respect indeed to respect and honour somebody's mother. We also pray to Ma as Skandamata in order to ask her to bless us with the virtues which she embodies, the greatness of spirit and charity she displayed by accepting Lord Skanda into her household despite his previous circumstances, and the forbearance and forgiveness of Lord Agni into the bargain, if one has that telling of the myth in mind, I suppose. The blessing of fertility and prosperity, the empowerment which she has given, not least as symbol in the flesh via her son, and the clarity and guidance which she possesses and can dispense for the devotee as her child also, just as she has done for Lord Skanda. No doubt also, the amazing strength of character of will, and when her offspring are perceived to be under threat, of the mother is a mighty boon indeed. In short, whether one is a mother, one has a mother, or one wishes to be guided and protected, supported and strengthened, and empowered to live in a virtuous way with regard to those of us around us to whom we owe the twin duties of care and community. She is a most amazing and worthy of aspect, Mataji to be honoured. Jai Mataji.